Dontrail is going to prove all of us wrong and I'll explain why. Most people think that Dontrail is just a regular anime filler beach episode, but I actually think the game is right for a comeback in a big way. Because if you put all the sneaky pieces together from all the past few months, including the fanfest, I have every reason to believe Yoshi P and team is on the brink of proving us wrong. And this is more than just a filler expansion. In fact, I think he has already masterminded a massive storyline decoy for Don Trail, and in very classic CBU3 fashion, it features a huge misdirection. But we'll get to that in the second half of this video. But first, a question. Why is Don Trail being positioned as a comeback? Because that will imply that Endwalker might have missed the mark towards the end. Let's take a moment and look back at Ann Walker's release. The excitement was palpable. Discussions on Discord was like fever pitch as the launch approached. We were waiting for the servers to go up. And the moment the servers went live and stabilized, there was a quiet that descended on Discord. And everyone was so deeply engrossed in the game. And Ann Walker achieved remarkable success for the expansion launch, surpassing even what CBU3 had anticipated, catching them off guard with the overwhelming server demand. And now as we approach the conclusion of Ann Walker, there's a kind of widespread term that is being used by players about the impact of the Final Fantasy 16 text. Now, for those unfamiliar, Yoshi P being the god developer he is, was simultaneously tasked by Square Enix to oversee Final Fantasy 16 on top of what he's doing for Final Fantasy 14. And considering his history of turning 14 around after a disastrous initial launch, this double duty sounds logical, but yet unreasonable at the same time. And make no mistake, Yoshi-P's effort has been nothing short of miraculous, turning 14 into one of the most cherished MMORPGs to date. And if you look at Square Enix's financials, it is their crown jewel. And naturally, Square Enix will want him in charge of Final Fantasy 16, their next prize title. But Yoshi-P is also bound to a human form. And it's clear it's such a Herculean ask to ask him to run two games at the same time. It naturally has challenges. And I think the post 6.0 patches following N Walker's launch, especially leading into 16's launch, definitely showed chinks in the armor. And the community coined Final Fantasy 16 text to describe the perceived dilution of Yoshi P's focus, which some do believe compromised the quality of N Walker's endgame content. Now, this split focus also meant that Yoshi P, despite his remarkable abilities, you know, he's faced with the inevitable constraints of the 24 hours in a day, which impacts the rollout of N Walker's post 6.0 endgame content as compared to previous expansions. So an example that a lot of people like to use is the Endwalker Relic Weapon System, which seemed to lack the depth and engagement of previous Relic Weapon Systems from Shadowbringers to Stormblood. It's clear some players do crave maybe a Relic System with a bit more of a challenge, perhaps involving cooperative group activities similar to the nature of Bostra. On the other hand, new systems like the Island Sanctuary was really fun in the first two weeks, but it probably wasn't something that could sustain interest over a prolonged period of time as a form of current content. Most of us maxed out our islands, and then we pretty much stopped checking in after some time, probably overgrown with weeds by now. These are just two examples. There's also other talks about how Criterion and Variant Dungeons should have better gear rewards. But the point is, this period is particularly significant as the 14th player base was at an all-time high following Ann Walker's launch, and it set new benchmarks for the game's narrative and content quality. Many players joined during the Shadowbringers expansion amidst the COVID pandemic, me including I was a Shadowbringers baby, and the response to the post-launch content was notably vocal. Now, if you're a third-party observer like me, one of the most common sentiment I've seen is that the end game content for Ann Walker just didn't capitalize on the momentum and positive sentiment generated by the immensely successful launch of Ann Walker. And we can speculate all we want, but Yoshi P himself has hinted in interviews at stepping back from leading future Final Fantasy titles, perhaps acknowledging the difficulty of running two Final Fantasy titles. And even though nothing has been decided according to Yoshi P, he explicitly stated that he thinks maybe it's time for someone new to take the reins because it would be good to look to the future and bring in a younger generation with a more youthful sensibilities to make Final Fantasy with a challenge that suits today's world. Now, if you read in between the lines, I can't help but wonder if running development on two games at the same time really took its toll on him. And having been part of the 14 community for a while, I think most of the feedback that we give is often rooted in a deep affection for the game. And Yoshipi's openness about possibly reducing his involvement in future mainline Final Fantasy projects speaks volume about his commitment in addressing community's concerns. But it's also very classic Yoshipi in terms of his proactive approach 
approach to community engagement. I think his statement about not potentially doing the next Final Fantasy title reflects his thoughtful self-awareness. It also acknowledges the unique challenges of upholding the quality of a live service MMO game while also contributing to another major title within the franchise. But essentially what he's doing in that media interview is that he's effectively signaling and freeing up more of his time and energy for 14, a game that has been close to his heart for over a decade. And he has said many times now, he's committed to leading 14 into the next decade, hinting at numerous exciting expansions already in his mind and on the horizon. And we all know, it's undeniable that when this man dedicates himself fully to a project, remarkable transformations occur, as seen with the 2.0 reboot. And viewing the current developments, I'm optimistic what lies ahead for 14 with Don Trill. And viewing the current developments, given everything I've heard and said, I am optimistic about what Dawn Trail holds. It's a symbol of a fresh commitment to the game's ongoing success and growth. Dawn Trail feels like a beginning of a new chapter for Yoshi P and the 14 team. It mirrors a classic storyline where the protagonist faces and overcomes new challenges. Which by the way, is also a very apt metaphor considering Dawn Trail is the start of a brand new multi-year story saga. So the teams experienced through the original disastrous launch, the A Realm Reborn era and the peaks of Shadowbringer and Endwalker has prepared them for this moment. And as Yoshi P turns his focus back to 14, I cannot wait to see what he has in store. But the discussion around the Final Fantasy 16 tags have sparked more than just debate. They have also highlighted how CBU3 is eager to challenge and surpass the expectations of some of the critics that they have gotten. Yoshi P's recent address at the fan festivals across all three continents have showcased a very deliberate emphasis on engaging with the community, especially with feedback. He has actively tackled players' concerns, and this is best characterized in his response to feedback about Ann Walker's lack of large-scale content similar to Eureka and Bostia. He promptly assured that Don Trio would reintroduce such expensive content, and I quote, he said, the team received a lot of feedback about no new field operations like Eureka or Bostia, there will be a new field operation in 7.x that will require a lot of players to participate to clear and they hope you look forward to future information. Now this approach seems entirely fitting. Having engaged with multiple MMOs, I've noticed a distinctive trait of the 14 community and that is the collective love for cooperative gameplay, to play together. Because from my earliest days in Uda as a Lara fell, there were spontaneous gatherings around performing bards and that was a very common sight. And it's evident that the shared experience is kind of like the fabric of this community. The initial charm of Island Sanctuary, despite its appeal, didn't quite capture the essence of cooperation play found in Bosnia or Eureka. And I think recognizing this, Yoshi P wanted to explicitly come out and address this point, that Dawn Trail would revive the open chat spaces that has cooperative play, and maybe hope to recapture that magic that made the content following previous expansions launches so engaging. In addition to reviving beloved content formats, Yoshi P also zeroed in on implementing quality of life improvements long requested by the community. A very good example is the introduction of the two dye color scheme for Glamour, so multi-channel color dyeing now. And this fulfills a widespread desire for more customization options that people have been asking for. And I still remember the loudest cheers at the keynote was reserved for this announcement. A testament to its significance to the player base, but also underlines how important Final Fashion 14 is to the endgame. And to outsiders, these little quality of life changes might seem minor within the scope of an MMO, but they reflect Yoshi Pieces understanding of the community's wishes. And I think it also showcases his commitment to enhancing the player experience even going into Dawn Trail. And that is why I think in typical CBU3 fashion, they have definitely heard the community's feedback about the post 6.0 Endwalker patches loud and clear. And for some of them, they have not directly addressed the feedback, but in very typical CBU3 fashion, I think they will just let the work speak for itself come down trail. And now moving past the discussions about the FF16 tags and the direct feedback from the community regarding post and Walker launch patches, I honestly believe the true potential of Don Trail to prove us wrong lies primarily within its deceiving storyline. And having navigated the main story quest for several years now, it's become increasingly clear to me that the team at CBU3 excels in skillfully misleading players about the direction of the 14th franchise's narrative. And for those yet to experience and Walker's 6.0 MSQs, a heads up, there's minor spoilers. The team's approach to storytelling is like a magician's sleight of hand, where the audience attention is drawn to one detail, only to be completely surprised by a twist. And reflect on how Shadowbringer's trailer cleverly used the Master Matoya reference, or the emphasis on the Moon and Zodiac for Endwalker, only for the storyline to take a sharp turn early in the expansion. We saw the Moon very early on, and we moved on from that for the real adventure only to begin in the second half for Elpis and then leading up to Ultima Thu. 
cool, an outcome no one could have predicted before Endwalkers' launch. And I think Dontrail seems to have its moment of misdirection with the introduction of the new striking zone shown at the Japan FanFest, Solution 9, which appears to be Dontrail's red herring. The reveal of this new zone Solution 9 has certainly piqued the interest and speculation of the community. It's been kind of positioned as a key part of the Dontrail storyline, seemingly poised to play an essential role. Yet, yeah, this feels like a very familiar scenario, very reminiscent of the Moonsess preview before Endwalkers' launch, and it leads me to speculate that Solution 9 might be a very clever diversion, meant to sidetrack us from the expansions' true narrative shift. And pivot to me is the keyword here. I think Solution 9 represents a major turning point in the story, just like the moon in Endwalker. It's heavily featured in pre-launch discussions, and it turned out to be just the beginning of a deeper narrative for the second half of Endwalker 6.0 MSQs. And Solution 9 could set up something similar. We've seen CBU3 enjoy incorporating twists and surprises to storytelling, and Solution 9 could be this very strategic move to maintain suspense in Dawn Trail, hinting at complexities beyond a mere beach episode. Because just look at the architecture. The futuristic and distinct appearance of Solution 9 compared to the other zones they introduced in the fan festival for Dawn Trail, it just naturally prompts community engagement and speculation. And organic hype is probably what they want leading into the expansion launch. But here's why my theory has legs as well. Yoshi P has hinted that Dawn Trails' narrative will unfold in two parts, a structure we have encountered in the Endwalker 6.0 MSQs as well, which was initially planned to span two expansions. This suggests that Solution 9 could mark a pivotal moment in Dawn Trail, transitioning from that light-hearted beach episode to uncovering more of a profound mystery. Because we already know at the start of the expansion, the Scions will be divided into two groups engaging in challenges and they might eventually converge on Solution 9, where I think they will face a shared challenge that then propels the story into its second and more mysterious phase that we know zero about. Now, I want to emphasize, that I don't foresee this in Dawn Trail leading to some world-ending threat. The team behind Yoshi P is known for crafting long, emotionally engaging narratives that pay off in the long run, rather than resorting to cheap, constant one-upping of world-ending stakes. This is not the Marvel movies we are talking about. So, what then is the significance of Solution 9? Well, first, let's consider what was revealed about Solution 9. From its futuristic design, it's evident that CBU3 is leveraging 14's unique position as an MMO that seamlessly blends elements of magic, with technology within the same universe. You know, consider the Alagans with their advanced technology like Dalamud, a celestial body imprisoning a dragon, Gallimald's moon cannon, Charlion's deep city rocket ship project, you get the point. This blend of magic and technology isn't just a hallmark of the 14 series, but it's also emblematic of the single player Final Fantasy games. CBU3 is capitalizing on this unique feature, with Solution 9 creating a very stark contrast to the holiday light -like atmosphere of the Dawn Trail cinematic. In this strategic decision to tease this at the JP FanFest, the last of all FanFests before we lead into the expansion launch, it seems intentional, and I think it's setting up to surprise those expecting another straightforward adventure. And there's speculation that Solution 9 might symbolize the bridge between the first and the 13th reflection. Given all these extensive foreshadowing we've seen in the MSQ, such as Rin and Gaia, and all these intricate plots around shard traveling, energy transfer, memory transmission, is Solution 9 literally like what its name suggests, a solution? One of them has too much light, one of them has too much darkness, maybe there's something there. Another intriguing theory suggests that Solution 9 could hark back to Zidane from Final Fantasy IX, because Solution 9 is his trans ability from the game. And considering 14's history of nodding to past Final Fantasy titles, this might hint at a deeper connection to FF9 within the narrative, especially with the introduction of the Viper job in Dawn Trail, which clearly has resemblances to Zidane's weapons. So maybe Solution 9 as a futuristic civilization is a throwback to Terra from FF9, and it represents an advanced civilization's quest for something. It's a tantalizing thought, especially as Dawn Trail marks the beginning of a new saga. Maybe is a brand new civilization, we don't know. Now, additionally, some also reckon that Solution 9's design cues draw from FF8's Esther, a city that is hidden through advanced technology. And this parallel suggests that Solution 9 could be similarly concealed, offering a fresh layer of mystery to the expansion, and it also explains why Solution 9 was nowhere to be seen in the trailer. But regardless, I firmly believe that we will encounter Solution 9 very early on in the MSQs for Dawn Trail, just like how quickly we were going to the moon in Endwalker 6.0 MSQ. And despite the trailer's upbeat tone, the lacking of any hint of darkness, it's clear to me that every expansion requires an antagonist. And my guess is that Solution 9 likely plays into the hinting of a lurking evil, 
and it sets the stage for that overarching narrative of a multi-year, multi-expansion saga. So the focus on Solution 9 as a narrative diversion is precisely why I think Dawn Trail might defy our expectations, why it might surprise us, why it might prove us wrong. It embodies that classic technique of subverting expectations, again, the moon in Endwalker, and this promises an experience that could very well mark its comeback as a franchise. And that is why, my friends, a comeback is brewing and please look forward to it. Subscribe if you like the content in this video, more Don Trail coverage and theories coming your way. A shout out to you Patreons, you are the real MVP. And by the way, if you're unaware, I just announced a massive podcast launching in March featuring the biggest 14 creators in the space. More details in the video on screen, you don't want to miss that.